All right, good afternoon, everybody. Let's get started. So, uh, I've got so for announcements, uh, this Friday we will be performing uh, lab three. And so, I recommend that you bring a laptop to this lab and either have the Arduino IDE installed, or we'll show you how to do that in lab if you're not familiar with doing that. Um, I recommend bringing a laptop and, and working on your laptop instead of the ITLL computers because the ITLL might have an older version of Arduino, um, that IDE installed, the software installed. The new version, and again, I'm not sure if they have it, the new version I know, uh, I know we used last year uh, has some pretty good features. It has better serial port monitoring. It has a better serial port plotter. I use the new version. That's what I'm going to be using. So again, I, I recommend bringing a laptop to the lab and using your own laptop. If you don't have a laptop right, that you can bring to lab, that's fine. You can still get by with the ITLL computers, but I think it's a little more um, user-friendly if you bring your own. So also next week, we have the first exam coming up. And the exam will be issued on Friday. I think that's the 27th. And then it'll be due uh, that Monday. So it's 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 essentially a take home exam. Um, you, you must work the exam alone. Uh, you submit the exam via Canvas. And I'm going to post a Canvas announcement with details on that. So, so look for that over the next uh, week when I send that out. Okay. So if you have any questions about the lab or what to bring or the exam, um, stop by office hours and we can chat after class. All right, so the last class we were talking about test and measurement equipment and we worked through the oscilloscope topics and today we're going to continue talking about function generators, waveform generators um, and data capture. And so I wanted to finish up this part of the class today because uh, we're doing this because I think it's useful to, when you walk into lab and see the equipment, to have an idea of what the equipment is capable of and say, instead of discovering later after the fact that the equipment's capable of automated measurements or, or, or um, you know, special measurements that, that could have helped you in the past. So I wanted to make sure you knew about this for this lab and for, for future work. So let's talk about waveform generators and function generators. Uh, these generators create AC voltage waveforms. And some of these common waveforms are uh, sinusoids, square waves, ramp or triangular waves, um, pulses, uh, noise, kind of a, a random signal, and also arbitrary waveform. Now, I will use function generators and waveform generators interchangeably, and, and some folks are bothered by that, but it, it doesn't bother me all that, what, all that much. I grew up with function generators. Um, strictly speaking, function generators could create sine waves and square waves and, and, and ramp and triangle waves and pulses. They could do that. Um, and, and they're called function generators because it's not just a sinusoid. When you think of a like a, an RF signal generator, those are typically sinusoids, maybe modulated sinusoids. But, um, but function generators create these you know, ramp waves with, with different rise times, things like that. Um, wa waveform generators, um, if you have an arbitrary waveform generator, that's something special and that's sometimes built into these generators. Arbitrary waveform generators mean, means that you could take a file, you could take like a, a CSV file, comma separated value file or some binary file and you can load that waveform into the, the generator, into the waveform generator and have it play periodically or over and over again or, or just a one shot when a trigger uh, is detected. So, so uh, again, I'll, I'll call function generators and waveform generators I'll, uh, the same thing. I'll use those interchangeably. If someone says arbitrary waveform generator, that, that's sort of a special function or a special generator where you can program in a waveform sample by sample and, and play it back out of the output of the generator. 
Okay, so applications of of waveform generators, um, ampl amplifier testing. So you can pr provide an input of a sine wave to an amplifier and measure the output with an oscilloscope. That will tell you the gain of an amplifier. You can test filters. So you, we talked about filters and how filters have a frequency response. And for example, low pass filters pass low frequencies and uh, block higher frequencies, reject higher frequencies. And so you can sweep, if you don't have a network analyzer, you can sweep uh, across frequencies and, and measure the output amplitude of the filter to measure uh, the, the frequency response. You can create PWM, pulse width modulated signals, to control the speed of a motor in place of a microcontroller, which you're going to do in, in lab. And you can create a uh, timing signal source. So if you need pulses every, you know, once per second, like you're simulating a pulse per second from a GPS source, you can uh, you can create that with a waveform generator. Okay, so examples like you're going to do in lab, you're going to control motor speed using duty cycle, um, and the source of that PWM signal is going to be at first the the waveform generator. Um, you can periodically trigger interrupts of a micro, microcontroller to test an RPM sensor. So if you don't actually have an RPM sensor and you want to test some code and you kind of know what the, R, the RPM, uh, let's say blade detection, blade crossing detection is, is going to output, then you can simulate that or emulate that with a waveform generator and test your code before you even have the hardware that will do that. Okay, so this is a good way to do that. And this is how I developed the, the project you're working on before I even had the, um, the obstacle detector, the, the blade crossing detector in place, I was testing out the code by creating pulses um, that, that I knew were within the range of RPM um, in terms of timing so that I could check my software. Okay, so on the front panel, this is the voltage waveform output here. It's a BNC connector. Don't get that confused with this sync connector here. That, that's, that can be used as an input for uh, timing of the output waveforms. Notice it says 50 ohms right here. That means uh, 50 ohm output impedance. So there's your waveform output. Uh, here are the main, main waveform parameters you can control with, with these buttons. And so this is the particular waveform generator that you have in, in lab, in the ITLL. Here are submenus for settings and waveform parameter control. So as you push the different uh, main parameter buttons, you get different soft keys down here uh, that control the waveforms. Okay, so let's talk about setting up a waveform. So you select the waveform type by pressing on the waveform buttons, waveform button on your particular generator that you have in lab. Even if you're working with another kind of another model of waveform generator, it probably has some similar button. If it's a modern generator, it probably brings up waveforms on the screen that you can select. So you can see here, you can select sine wave, square wave, ramp, pulse, or, or arbitrary, where you would program in uh, the, the samples of a waveform. You can set up the parameters of the major chosen waveform by pressing parameters. And so you can set the frequency um, or the amplitude and the amplitude, uh, a DC offset, and the phase if you're timing that to some input signal, or if you have a two-channel waveform or function generator, you can you can um, define a phase between the two channels of the periodic waveforms. So you get this kind of display on the screen of this waveform generator. Um, note that the waveform on the screen is not actually a measurement of the waveform being created. So uh, if you really want to see what's coming out of the waveform generator, uh, you, you, have to, you have to measure the waveform at the output. This is really just a cartoon describing the waveform settings. So it tries to illustrate, well, you have a sine wave and well, you might have a zero offset or, or a, a DC offset to that wave. So it tries to show you that, but um, there are, there are uh, uh, ways to connect a waveform generator to a circuit and actually not have the the waveform that you would measure equal the waveform that's shown on the cartoon here on the screen. So if you really want to know 
what's coming out of the generator or when it's connected to a circuit, what the shape of that waveform looks like. Definitely connect a, an oscilloscope to the, um, the place in the circuit where you're applying the waveform. So let's let's talk about creating an offset square wave because you're going to do this. You're going to need to do this in lab uh, probably this Friday. So function generators can create waveforms to 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 simulate digital circuits, and you can use these for digital circuit synchronization, or in other words, a clock signal. A clock signal is just a a square wave with a given timing where you want events to happen on either the rising edge or the falling edge of a square wave, or, or maybe both. Um, function generators uh, can also create waveforms for pulse width modulation, and you're going to use this feature. So the square waves generated by a, uh, a generator uh, typically may not match by default what you want to simulate a digital logic level signal. Okay, so a digital clock typically for common circuits um, alternates between two digital logic levels. So if you have five volt logic and you need, um, you need to simulate or emulate five volt logic with a function generator, you want a square wave that alternates between zero volts and five volts. Um, if you have three volt logic or 3.3 volt logic, you want a square wave that alternates between zero volts and 3.3 volts. Okay, so let's say you want to create that. Um, what, what you have to do is you have to use the DC offset to make sure that you're not applying a negative voltage and too small of a positive voltage to the, to the digital circuit. So uh, DC offsets are typically used to create the digital or pulse width modulated square wave. Okay, so here's an example. So you have the waveform generator set up to have a five volt peak to peak amplitude and an offset of zero volts. Usually when you turn on the function generator, power it up, this is what you're gonna see. And if you measure the output with an oscilloscope, you're going to see this. Here's a five volt peak to peak square wave Right, as specified here, with a zero volt offset, right, as you see here. Um, and, and, and so this is what you'd see. Uh, you see uh, a zero volt offset. And by that, I mean, if you look at halfway between maximum and minimum of the square wave, that's about zero volts. OK, and then you have a five volt peak to peak, which means you're going negative to negative 2.5 volts positive to positive 2.5 volts and peak to peak that's five volts so if you just show up at a function generator or a waveform generator and you you just enter five volts give me a square wave and you expect it to be some kind of digitally compatible signal it's it's really not what you want um, what you typically want to do to generate a digital signal is have some kind of dc offset so here i have five volt peak to peak simulating five volt logic and I've set an offset of 2.5 volts, right? Half of that amplitude. And so what you would get out of the function generator and measure it on an oscilloscope is this. Uh, you have zero volts as the minimum voltage here, five volts as the maximum voltage because you have a 2.5 volt offset. So if you're, if you're generating, if you want to generate a square wave for the purpose of an input to a five volt digital circuit, like a five volt Arduino or other five volt microcontroller, um, or even an input to an analog circuit, like, like a motor driver uh, MOSFET that wants to see at its input, either zero volts or five volts, you have to do something like this. You have to use the offset. All right, and shout out any questions if you want to talk about this more or shoot me a chat via Zoom. So let's talk about creating a pulse with modulated voltage. So the, these function generators or waveform generators typically produce square, wave, square waves with a definable duty cycle. And you can use that to emulate a 
pulse width modulation controller. Okay, so what you typically do is you, you set the uh, the peak to peak voltage and the offset voltage to create the square wave that you want, just like we did on the last slide. And then you set the duty cycle, and, for example, to control the speed of a motor. So the duty cycle controls the percentage of time that the waveform is high. So effectively, it's controlling the uh, average voltage of the output square wave. Um, or if it's connected to something like a, a MOSFET or other type of transistor, it's turning that transistor on for a period of time, typically when the waveform is high, and then turning the transistor off for a period of time when the waveform is low. And so, so that transistor would typically pulse the power to a motor and control the, ma the motor's speed. We'll talk more about that. All right, so, so for example, uh, in this case where you have a duty cycle of 20%, if you measure the output of this function generator with an oscilloscope, you would see this. You would see uh, a square wave or a rectangular wave that is zero, then it jumps up to five volts for a little bit and then jumps down to zero. So the period of this waveform is 500 microseconds here in this case. And since the period is 500 microseconds T and I have a duty cycle of 20%, I would get 0.2 of that T, right, 0.2 times 500 microseconds high for that waveform. So that would be controlling a motor on the, on the lower end of its speed range, the bottom 20%. If I change the duty cycle to 80%, you go into the, right, you go into the menu uh, of the function generator, you click on duty cycle down here, there's a button below this, and you dial up 80%, you would see this. So here is zero volts, Here's five volts. You can see the square wave alternates between zero volts and five volts. Okay, and we still have a 500 microsecond period. So that, that comes from setting the frequency, 2000 Hertz. One over 2000 Hertz is 500 microseconds. And since the duty cycle is 80%, the waveform is high 80% of the time. So the waveform is high 0.8 times T here. All right, so that's that's how you're going to control the function generator in lab before you have a microcontroller programmed to test pulse width modulated control, speed control of, of your motor. Okay, so there's there's a trap you can fall into. I like having you avoid these traps, but everybody runs into them. I call this the output impedance trap. Okay, so if you, if you look at the screen here, I just have a sine wave, um, frequency of looks like 100 Hertz, an amplitude of two volts peak to peak. Okay, so that's, that's, what, I've, that's what I've set. And so you'd think that, well, I mean, whatever you measure out of this, waveform generator, it would be two volts, right? Because you have a two volt uh, AC supply. You would think you would always have two volts, but that's not the case. It depends on the setting of the output impedance and what the waveform generator is connected to. Notice here in the upper left that I have the output impedance set to 50 ohms. This function generator, waveform generator, can be set to an output impedance of either 50 ohms or high Z, right? High Z is the other selection. So let's talk about what happens when you when you use those settings and what the difference is, because people usually fall into this. I'll, I'll see this in lab. It, it looks like you're measuring uh, an amplitude that is different from what you set in the function generator. And here's why. Okay, so here's the function generator. Uh, I've set, so in reality, in reality, that function generator has an output impedance of 50 ohms. It just does. It's, it's set up like that. It has a BNC connector 
that is meant to be connected to a 50 ohm characteristic impedance cable, it has a 50 ohm output impedance. So if you draw the Thevenin equivalent of the function generator, you would get a, uh, you would have a voltage source that represents whatever voltage waveform you're creating, an AC waveform, and you'd have this 50 ohm resistor. That's, that's, that's how it's modeled. Okay, so when, when you have the output impedance set to 50 ohms, um, the, the waveform generator function generator is expecting to be connected to a 50 ohm load. So this 50 ohm resistance. So, and here's the, here's the load voltage across that resistance. And you have, um, so if you have two volts peak to peak set and you have a 50 ohm resistor connected to the output of the function generator, you will see two volts peak to peak across the load. And here it is, right? Here's, here, here is that function generator connected to a 50 ohm resistor. And I'm measuring with an oscilloscope across that resistor V sub L of T. And here's two volts peak to peak. So that's exactly what we expect. That's what the function generator is expecting for a load and everything's working out fine. Now, if you look at this diagram here, well, how do you get two volts peak to peak across this 50 ohm load if you have a 50 ohm output impedance, this Thevenin resistance here? Because we have a voltage divider, right? This, there's a voltage divider, 50 ohms, 50 ohms, they are in series, and we're looking at the voltage across the load, which is across one of those resistors. Okay, so in order to get two volts here, you have to have four volts peak to peak generated here, right? right? So, so this isn't the actual circuit inside the function generator, but it does represent what's going on because the function generator acts like a linear circuit with resistors and sources. So you can model that function generator as a Thevenin equivalent. Okay, so here we go. This is this is how you get two volts peak to peak. And internally, when in the function generator, when you set two here, it's actually doing something to create four volts here in its equivalent circuit. Okay, now now the problem comes in. Let's suppose that you're not connecting to a 50 ohm load. So you 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 show up at the bench and you just want to connect, you know, you want to connect to the input of a, I don't know, an op amp or some circuit that has a pretty high resistance or a high input impedance. It looks like an open, or you don't even connect anything. You just don't connect anything to the output terminals, the BNC connector of the function generator, and you just connect an oscilloscope. Okay, and, and I don't change anything. I just, I just leave these settings the way they are. Two volts peak to peak. So you would think that you would get two volts here. Well, that doesn't happen, right? Because we still have this four volt peak to peak sinusoidal source here. And I have a resistor with no current going through it. If, if these terminals are open, I have no current going through that 50 ohm resistor. So there's zero voltage across that resistor. If you run a KVL equation around that loop, you will see VL is actually four volts peak to peak. So this is where people um, using test equipment, using function generators, uh, Get, get this a little wrong and, and try to fix it. And they start compensating, trying to figure out, well, what amplitude do I have to set to really get two volts here? Um, it's not that the, the user has set the amplitude wrong. It's that they've assumed that the load is 50 ohm impedance. Okay. But, but in this case, what you're going to see if you don't have a 50 ohm load and you're either using a high impedance load or just measuring the output with an oscilloscope, you're going to see a four volt peak to peak signal, right? Maybe that's not what you want. Probably is not what you want. Okay, so if a function generator is set to 50 ohms, the output voltage will be twice what you expect when connected to a high impedance. Okay, and by what's so what's high? You know, I don't know, 10 or 20 times 50 ohms, uh, you're gonna have an output wave that looks a lot like double what you expect. Okay, and what else can happen is, let's suppose you don't have a 50 ohm load, you have a 100 ohm load. Well, now you have a voltage divider between 50 ohms and 100 ohms. And so it's not going to be, it's not going to be what is set, it's not going to be twice, it's going to be somewhere in between because you have a voltage divider. Um, it's actually, if this is 100 ohms, you're going to get two thirds of four volts showing up as the load. Okay. Okay, so Continuing on, um, 
let's suppose you set two volts peak to peak and you set the output impedance to high Z. So you go into the settings, you go into the channel settings of the function generator and you set high Z. And high Z means you don't expect to connect this to any kind of low resistance value. You expect the generator is going to be connected to a, a big resistance. You know, what's big? I don't know. A couple thousand ohms, thousand, two thousand, many times, you know, 10 or 20 times, at least 50 ohms. Okay, so here's the function generator. Even though you've set the output to high Z, the function generator still has an output impedance of 50 ohms. Okay, and if you measure the output with no load connected, you're going to see two volts peak to peak, right? Because you're set to high Z and two volts peak to peak, and you have a high Z, high impedance applied, infinite in this case. So to get two volts peak to peak at the output, this Thevenin source here, the Thevenin voltage is going to be two volts peak to peak. There's no current going through that 50 ohm resistor. So VT will equal VL. Okay, now let's suppose, well, you're really going to connect a 50 ohm load. You take that BNC connector, you connect a BNC cable, and you apply it to the input of a device that is that looks like a 50 ohm resistor, and you set two volts peak to peak. Well, what's going to happen is, well, you've got a voltage divider, and so VT is still two volts peak to peak. That happens when you have the high Z setting and two volts here, and so now you're going to see one volt peak to peak. Okay, so if the function generator is set to high Z, if you connect to a 50 ohm load, you're going to expect half of what you've set on the function generator in terms of amplitude. Okay, okay so, so, so the lesson here is function generators have a 50 ohm output impedance typically. The setting high Z or 50 ohms doesn't change that typically, at least on this generator and those that I've used. And so, so you have to pay attention to what load you're connecting, what the resistance value is in order to know what, um, what the voltage is going to be and what you have to set to get a particular voltage. Okay. And, or, or, or if it's safe to do so with the load circuit, you can, well, you have one volt here, or maybe this is like, you know, 200 ohms and you don't want to do the calculations or you don't know what to set the setting to you can you can just adjust the amplitude up or down um, to get the voltage you want right the voltage that you want is is not going to be what's set here in the amplitude and as long as you don't change the load resistance the voltage will stay the same but if you change the load resistance the voltage is going to change because you have a different voltage divider ratio Okay, so that's one of the bigger confusions I, I see in lab, and I'm trying to trying to not um, have you waste time <laughs> trying to figure out the function generator and how it's behaving, and uh, uh, at least you'll remember this when the amplitude doesn't uh, isn't what you expect. Okay, all right. And again, if you want to talk about this more, if you've had problems like this in the past, stop by office hours and let's let's talk about that. So some general guidance for electrical test and measurement. So we we covered this test equipment, the test equipment you have in lab. There are there's other test equipment. There's like load emulators and controllable supplies and um, spectrum analyzers, network analyzers, things like that. Uh, so lots of equipment we didn't cover. Um, or if you want different explanations or to learn about more features, right? there's lots out there on the internet. Check web pages, watch some YouTube videos. And, and I think now with what you have, with what we've talked about and what you brought to this class in terms of knowledge, um, I think you'll be able to figure it out. Okay, so so for example, when you get to using network analyzers to measure filters or spectrum analyzers to, to look at frequency components of a signal, I think you can figure it out. Um, I, I give the advice to recall the default settings uh, when, when you show up at a bench to put the instrument into a known state. I think that's for every instrument that has 
a, a preset state or a factory state, uh, I would recall those before using the equipment. And if the equipment is not showing the measurements that you expect, right? I like to say this straightforwardly and honestly, if the equipment isn't showing what you expect, then the circuit is either designed wrong or the circuit is built wrong or the circuit's being tested wrong. And oftentimes, you know, I don't know which is more likely. Often built wrong is, uh, is the case because it's uh, sometimes these circuits are complex. But it could be a design or construction problem with the circuit under test. You could have the wire in the wrong place or a wire came out or, you know, something's not connected like, like you expect. You might have incorrect equipment settings. So if you're looking at the oscilloscope and you don't see a sinusoid and you should have a sinusoid, then, then make sure that the time scale matches the frequency of the waveform um, that you're expecting to measure. Also make sure the amplitude is in the range of what you're expecting to measure and beware of auto scale. Beware of that auto scale button. Sometimes it zooms in on, 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 on a part of the waveform you don't want to look at, you don't care about. You might have improper connections uh, to the circuit for the measurements being made. So you might have a, um, you know, a ground probe of the oscilloscope connected to the, the, wrong, the wrong place, or the probe might be connected to the wrong place. So, so check that. And also remember that ground connections between the circuit and the equipment, well, the whole circuit has to have a common ground node, typically. And the equipment that has ground has to be connected to that ground node, typically. Okay, so when you look at your project schematic, all of those ground symbols should be connected to the same node. And it gets a little confusing because some of these grounds are on the breadboard. Some of these grounds are on the circuit board that you just built, the motor driver. Some of these grounds are to that separate DC to DC converter module. There's another ground at the battery pack that all those grounds have to be connected together in some way. And it can cause a, a, a problem with the circuit and the pro a problem with measurements if you don't have all those grounds connected. Um, for the ammeter, if you're making current measurements, check for that blown fuse like I talked about. And then I mentioned ground loops. Right? So the oscilloscope, I, I mentioned that BNC connector on this oscilloscope, it's, it's shield, it's negative side, is connected to earth ground, AC ground. So if you took it, if you take an ohm meter, don't, don't do this unless you know what you're doing. But if you take an ohm meter and you, you measure the resistance between the shield of that BNC connector, the outer conductor, right? And and the ground terminal of an AC circuit, you'll see they're, they're connected, right? On this oscilloscope, they're connected. And also with the function generator, you'll notice that BNC connected uh, connector, its shield is connected to AC ground. So even though you don't have this equipment connected, the oscilloscope and the function generator directly, there is a connection between those two shields. And when you start probing around, maybe moving the ground connection around from the oscilloscope to your circuit, and then from the function generator to the circuit, if you don't connect those to, to the ground or they're connected to different nodes, you're shorting between those two nodes. Okay, so you know, that's, that's another thing that, that's another topic that falls under tested wrong. That's an improper connection. So if, if you're not getting what you expect, it's probably, it is one of those three, three things. And I know uh, uh, debugging circuits and measuring circuits can get frustrating. You have these wires that can pull out and you have sometimes these big alligator clips that are hard to clip onto a small lead on one of these components. So a methodical approach and patience is key. So uh, take it slow because slow is smooth and smooth is fast. And if you want to get through your measurements as fast as possible, take it, take it slow and, um, and use a methodical approach. And here's what a methodical approach means. It means before you connect a piece of measurement equipment, you should have an idea of what you expect to see. If you're probing a power supply on this Arduino board or in your circuit, you should expect to see five volts if it's the VCC voltage, right? So you should expect to see DC. If you see some kind of AC waveform, you, you, you know instantly you're not seeing the right voltage. So before you go into measurements, look at the circuit, 
check it out and say, okay, this is going to be DC and roughly what the range should be. You know, the output of the temperature sensor, it should be about you know, whatever the temperature is, 1.1 volts at this temperature. So kind of know what you're looking for before you start measuring. And, and then that helps you find out, okay, is it the circuit that's designed wrong? Is it the circuit construction? It's built wrong, or do I have not? Do I not have the connections from the test equipment to the circuit in the right place? Okay, this 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 seems like a, you know simple stuff, but it's really important. So I wanted to say that out loud. Okay, so um, along with taking measurements comes presenting your measurement data. And so I wanted to talk about capturing data and presenting that data because I think it'll help you, especially in your early career, when you're presenting to different audiences. I noticed this a lot in, um, in my engineering job where we're trying to, a team is trying to show results internally, show results to other engineers, maybe show results to engineering leadership, maybe show results to a customer. And there are some things that um, you know, eventually you think they're obvious, but in the beginning, they don't seem so obvious. So I wanted to call out some of the things that, that, that I notice um, and have to correct or improve about um, you know, starting engineers. And you may be an experienced engineer and you may have run into this, but I just want to throw this out there because I think it's important and it's noticed. So if you come in with some of these skills, you'll be viewed as a, uh, um, a, a more mature engineer and one that your management wants to, uh, to throw in front of customers and present. And that usually helps you get the, get the good work, the work that you want to work on. Okay, so let's talk about uh, test equipment screen captures. Test equipment screen captures are important um, to show actually just, just the raw measurements, right? So if you tell someone you had a certain voltage peak to peak and it was a sinusoid, you know, I guess they'll believe you, but sometimes they want to know, well, was it noisy or, you know, was it very smooth and does the period look regular? And, you know, so screen captures help you demonstrate the measured results and capture more than you can just describe in a few words. And these um, test equipment screenshots also provide baseline data for later comparison. So you can see if something changed, if something got noisier now all of a sudden when the motor's running compared to when the motor wasn't running. Okay, so make sure that the data is readable. So if I go and I throw this in front of a, in front of a customer in my management and I say, look, I have a triangle wave or a ramp, ramp function. And so it looks like we expect it's a ramp function. And someone has a question about, well, you know, What's what's the period of that? Do we have the right period because we're seeing a problem? And is that the right amplitude? And you have the right DC offset? You can't really read that here, right? This is a screen capture, but I can't really read what what those values are. So we can't read the axis, we can't read the scales, we can't read numeric values, we can't read measurements. This is not a good screen capture. Um, most equipment has most modern equipment has some function where you can actually capture the bitmap or JPEG image of the screen. So something like this, this is where your 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 uh, you know principal engineers can can come in and look at this. Your customer can come in and their technical uh, representatives can look at this and say, yeah, okay, I know it's not working, and we thought it was this waveform, but n now we think it's not this waveform because you've measured it and you captured it on this date. We see we we see it, so you could just move on to the uh, the next problem. Okay, so you can take a screen capture. You can even do photos. If you can't get a, a screen capture off an instrument for some reason, um, you can even take photos, but make sure those photos are, are very clear that, so you can read that, that data. Okay, and set the scales so that the data can be interpreted. So if I were a customer and I'm looking at like, okay, we need a certain rise rate, a ramp rate of this, right? Maybe this is a, <clears throat> this is a, swept frequency control voltage for some kind of, um, you know, some kind of radar or something. And, and the radar isn't returning good results. Well, if I show this and I say, look, it's a ramp, you can see it. And they're going to go, well, what's the slope? I can't even read that here on the right. You can read the slope on the left. 
uh, you can't. So the, the, the really, the important thing is to try to capture the characteristics that you think are important. And this is hard to do, even characteristics that you don't know are important. So um, images are cheap as long as you keep them organized. And so take lots, take lots of uh, screen captures of measurements, and then you'll be able to go back. You wouldn't believe how many times I've taken my own measurements. And then later measurements are done, equipment's put away. And I'm like, oh, wow, I didn't, I didn't measure something. I can go back to the screenshots and, 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 and pick out the data that I might have missed mentally. Okay, so PC screen captures show test data, plots, and results acquired by PC software. So again, you could you could describe the convergence of your motor. You're going to capture these in lab. You you could you could describe. Look, here is orange. Let's see, where is this here? Um, where's com commanded? A desired RPM. Orange is desired RPM. So we're commanding the RPM to go from zero up to a thousand RPM, and you could see. A, a response to the measured RPM, right? Overshoot and then convergence. So you're going to see this and you're going to play with this control loop in lab. But but this tells you, right? You can look at the delay. You can look uh, at the delayed response. You can look at the, the error. So the yellow is the error here, right? So here, here's a big error and the error starts to fall. The error goes negative. The error converges to zero. You can see all this in a PC screen capture on a plot. If you just describe this and you say, yeah, uh, it looks like it, just, it it converges in a hundred samples or whatever it is here, right? That that's information. But taking screen captures um, of of plots and even text is important. You're going to take screen captures of the the text output of the serial monitor so that you can you can demonstrate that your project is connecting to Wi-Fi. It's connecting to the right IP address. Here's your you know, MAC address, we know, we can identify the Arduino that we're using. We can see that everything is set up right. And if you're having a Wi-Fi problem, we'd say, well, you know, it looks like before you have actually connected. So taking screen captures is important. Um, you can do that with snipping tools, There's lots of different snipping tools, but Windows has one built in. So uh, I, it, you probably use this already. If you haven't, um, type in snip into the, the you know, the Windows, search bar next to the what used to be the start button. Um, and so then you can you can capture windows and screens, save them off as JPEGs, save them in PowerPoint files. I'll actually sit there when I'm taking measurements and I'll open up a new PowerPoint presentation and I'll just start without formatting, just pasting screen captures in from either instruments or the PC. Um, and taking little notes and text around. And that's that's my ore. I call that my ore of data, like mining. That's my ore from which I'm going to um, parse out and, and take the important information later when I figure out what the, the important information is. And you can do alt print screen to capture active windows to the clipboard. Again, just like reading axes, make sure that the text is readable. If you, if you, you, know, if you zoom in on this right down here, it's probably not readable. It's not gonna tell you what, what your IP address was. So, because you're not going to be able to read it. So that's important. Again, you, like you think this is obvious. I see, I see a lot of this um, come in, in into presentations, and it's it's um, it's rough when uh, when it goes when this goes live in front of a customer. Maybe we haven't caught it, and um, customers notice. And if they can see the data and they can see your, your, your results and they can understand it, and they can interpret it and it's readable, they will trust you more. You'll have less problems working with them and um, you'll get the better work. Okay, so photos, hardware photos I emphasize. And this is probably one of the biggest missed things by engineers of all levels. Photos show important features during tests, during assembly, during production, they're really important. And, and photos are really cheap now. You can take lots of photos and you can store them in a folder. You can take videos too, videos work. I've done that a lot too lately. But you can see um, sort, of the, sort of the unmeasured or the forgotten details um, of, of your test or of your, of your build. So, so photos help identify hardware issues when seeing anomalies 
um, during analysis after testing. So you did some tests, it looks good, uh, but but then you say, well, wait a minute, look, you're looking at the data after the test and, and something happened here, something is wrong. You know, you might have measured RPM that falls to zero, but you know the prop was spinning on your project. And so, um, you know, and, and here the measured RPM falls to zero, the error rises and the duty cycle is going up. So it looks like the motor is trying to increase its speed, but but you don't know what's going wrong. So here's a photo before the start of the test and and then a photo after the end of the test. And this this often helps. So while you're analyzing the data, you say, well, what's different here, right? What's, this, this is the same project. Well, in this case, if you look, you'll notice in the photo, what, what are the differences? This is like one of those internet, what are the differences between these photos? Look, the, 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 the sensor LED is off. The power LED is off. Okay, well then how do you figure out what's going on? Well, in this case, the five volt source was disconnected. Okay, so, okay, that makes sense. Now, can you identify what wire that is? But well, maybe, maybe not. But if you have enough photos, you can kind of trace it down or deduce that, hey, the power's off here. Could that be the power wire? supplying five volts to the, the obstacle detector, the, the blade crossing detector. So photos help um, to, to diagnose problems after a build, right after you've built something, uh, during transition to production. So if you've got a prototype and now you're going to, to production and your early production um, hardware units don't work, you can look at photos and you can see differences uh, between what did work and what isn't working. And you also can take photos, and I we, we do this a lot during production processes. So, so especially when features of hardware get covered up, like if each one of these units that you see here on this prototype get enclosed in a box and wired together and built up into a larger enclosure, you take pictures as you build, and then you could see later without opening up the box, sometimes that's destructive. Uh, you can see what, what might be wrong with production units. Okay, And photos also demonstrate that the engineering results are real. We have a real product here. It's not just PowerPoint block diagrams and, and, and plots that you have a, a, a real product and these are the measurements from it. Um, and it gives confidence to your customers. It gives confidence to management. It gives confidence to your team. And it convinces everybody, gives them the, the motivation that work should, should continue. Okay, so I wanted to spend a little time on that. Um, I have a lot more to say on this topic, but I'm limiting it to just maybe two or three slides here because it's, it's really like when you're presenting your data, when you're, cap when you're presenting your data, this is important. When you're capturing your data, that's where it starts. So make sure you capture enough data um, because eventually it, it, it's going to be needed. It's likely to be needed. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna wrap up uh, this electrical test and measurements, and then we'll move on to the next topic next time. But just some big takeaways here. So understanding the the functions and and capabilities of test equipment is important because it helps you plan the steps for development of your project or product. Right? If you you have to know what can be measured, so that you can plan incrementally, we're going to perform measurements. Um, along the development path. So you can inc incrementally verify that your design is doing what you expect. Okay, so understanding the automated measurements of the oscilloscope, the programmability of the waveform generator, what the, uh, what the multimeter can measure and how you might connect that to your circuit in different places. Um, uh, understanding all that helps you incrementally verify your design. So data capture approaches and advanced features of the test equipment uh, support all phases of prototype development and requirements verification. So, so you can, um, you know, f from from you know cradle to grave, from oh. your your first resistor on a breadboard and your first simple circuit doing measurements, all the way to in the end when you have a printed circuit board and you've you've designed your test points into that circuit board so that you can actually get to those signals. Um, you know, you think about that during the whole design process and you might use some of those more advanced features of, of the oscilloscope, for example, to verify the signals 
the voltages, the currents are what you expect. Okay, and at the same time, every time you show up in lab, like either it's a new set of equipment or um, you haven't been in front of the equipment in a while, expect to sense, spend some time learning to use the equipment, even if you've used it before, or new types of equipment or different models of test equipment, um, and, and spend some time to learn how to make the measurements you want. You might even have some, some known circuits that you practice measuring on. And so you might verify that you're using the equipment correctly before depending upon those measurements. Like, if, like start with a known voltage, start with a known waveform, measure it, make sure um, you're measuring properly. You know, for example, if you're using an oscilloscope you're not familiar with, and I've been using oscilloscopes for you know over 30 years, I still sit down with an oscilloscope and I connect to a waveform generator, function generator, signal generator with a known output. And then I get on the oscilloscope and I, I look at the measurement and I make sure that peak to peak values are getting calculated properly, RMS values are getting calculated properly, periods, frequencies, things like that. And then only after I measured a known waveform do I trust that, not, not that the oscilloscope's working, but that I honestly know how th that what I'm doing is probably right. Okay. So if you'd like to talk about this more, uh, stop by office hours. I'd be happy to chat about this. Um, in closing, check Canvas for the due times and the due dates. So you have homework three that is coming up due uh, next Wednesday. So take a look at that. Uh, you have an exam coming up next week that's going to be issued Friday and essentially take home. And I'm going to send out an announcement via Canvas on that. I will start office hours in just a few seconds. So if you'd like to chat during office hours about anything or just listen in, uh, stick around on this session. If not, I'll see you next time. Have a great night.